Uh, so we will bring Ned onto the stage now. Wonderful. Ned, can you hear me? I can indeed. How are you doing? Fantastic. I'm very well. Let me just uh, share. I'll make sure you're all set and then I'll jump off. Wonderful. I think you're all set, so I'll jump off and I'll be in the background. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to me talk today. Um, I'm going to be talking about speeding up the user feedback loop um, and go through a few examples of what I really mean by that. Uh, and uh, specifically how actually some of the techniques that maybe you've been using in the past uh, apply to that uh, and maybe ways that people can um, do things better in the future. So obviously a bit of a strange way of presenting. Um, I, I hope we don't have any technical issues. I, I, I actually love being on stage, so this is quite a, quite a weird experience. So let's hope it all works out well. Okay, so what am I gonna be talking about today? Uh, I'll be talking about what the user feedback loop is. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, Agile Manifesto, APIs, culture, and um, a couple of different uh, examples of the feedback. B2B or an internal customer scenario, and in a B2C feedback loop uh, scenario, and, and what the difference between those two are. Uh, before I get into that, uh, I will just talk for, for one minute about Sing Life. I promise this is the only reference to Sing Life I'll make in the entire presentation. Um, so, so we're, as, 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 uh, as introduced, we're a, a digital insurance company here in Singapore. Have, uh, offices also in the Philippines and we'll be expanding out further into the region uh, soon. And, and what we're really looking to do is unlock the potential of money for everyone. And what I mean by that is uh, we're trying to create a holistic financial experience where we can offer people products that are protecting themselves and their wealth, uh, but also uh, growing their wealth through um, ILP products and things like that. And, and quite uniquely, I think, for an insurer managing their wealth whereby we've created a, a, the everyday insurance account, which is a 2.5% uh, insurance policy with uh, zero lock-in. You can put your money in, take your money out anytime. And uh, I think relatively uniquely in, in the world, actually, and please someone correct me, uh, we've attached a Visa debit card to that. So that when you spend on your card, it's actually doing a, a partial withdrawal of the underlying policy. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Okay. So... What is the user feedback loop? Um, let's break down those words. Uh, the first word is, is the user. And I think it's very important for people to be very clear, and technology sometimes miss this, is who is the actual user of this application? It, it, it could be something simple like an internal business unit. Uh, it could be an external user of the application in a B2C scenario. But it could actually be many other people as well. So, for example, someone who is purchasing the data or utilizing the data. And that's particularly uh, true in, say, a freemium model where um, your, your free customers uh, are perhaps not the customer that you want to optimize around. The, the customer you want to optimize around are those that upsold into a, into a different plan. So it's very important to identify initially who that uh, user is. The second bit is around what is feedback, and, and there's clearly missing broken functionality. That's quite obvious. The next set of requirements uh, in, in, of what needs to be uh, worked on on the roadmap. But the, the third point, I think, is, is probably the important one I want to highlight here, is that it has actually two different types of feedback, and I think sometimes we, we don't utilize both channels. And I'm calling it active versus automatic. Maybe there's a better name for it out there. That's what I came up with. And um, active feedback is where there's someone actively giving it to you, whether that's a, a human being uh, that, that's part of your own team or, or, or company or an external person, focus group, etc. But this is elicited feedback where someone says something specific. But there's also a lot of opportunities to get automatic feedback, and that's through things like data and the collection of data to see how people are using the system. And we'll come back to that one a little bit later. And then the third point, of course, is the loop itself, so the user feedback loop. And we have feedbacks and requirements being given uh, from, from the user in the first place. The tech team responds to that, releases a new product, and then the user interacts with that next version of the product. Now, so far, this is all probably pretty simple stuff. You understand it. But I'm going to maybe explore this one a little bit deeper to show how perhaps you uh, aren't necessarily tight, as tight about loop as you might think you are. And, and, and a 
question that I often ask uh, teams that I work with or, 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 or external people who I, who I have conversation with is, is how tight is that loop between the real user, not a proxy, a real user giving feedback or, or setting requirements in the first place and then interacting with it and giving the next set of feedback. And I think that we'll find that a lot of the uh, progression of technology, uh, both from a, an approach perspective and literal tech, over the last few years, or, or maybe has always been this way, has been about tightening that loop and making it faster and faster for people to give feedback. Okay. So I wanted to pull out at this point the Agile Manifesto. And the reason why I think this is super important to realize is that I talk to so many people, and hopefully no one on this call, but uh, I talk to so many people who talk about Agile and talk about Agile methodologies, and maybe they're Scrum Masters, and maybe they've done this, that, and the other, but they've never actually read the Agile Manifesto. And so I would encourage everyone, if you haven't read it, to just Google Agile Manifesto. It's a website. It's, it's all out there. And it talks about uh, two different things. First, around uh, the way that companies should operate, and also 12 principles that allow you to operate in that Agile way. And sometimes I worry that people have lost the, the connection between uh, the original intention of Agile versus what has become around a, a, bit of a, a bit of a cottage industry, really. And I've taken uh, six points here. These are six bullets from the principles of the Agile Manifesto. And you'll see that what it's really talking about in many ways is, is the is the, is, the, is the feedback loop, right? It talks about you need to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery, okay? You have to deliver working software frequently, and working software is an important word, and we'll come back to that in a second, where working software is the primary measure of progress. Um, now, to me, working software means something that a real user can actually use, even if it doesn't really do very much. And, and I think um, sometimes when we're building things, we don't always use that as, as, the, as the measure of progress. We look at things like how many check-ins we've done or how many JIRA pro, um, tickets we've done. But the software itself isn't necessarily in a working state that can actually be used by someone, even if the functionality is very limited. And again, we'll come back to that a little bit uh, as we progress through this. Again, I'd encourage everyone, please, to read the Agile Manifesto if they haven't already. So here's, uh, here's a guy from BigCo, uh, and he says, well, I already do Agile. Um, maybe he's done his training. But sometimes my business users say that they actually preferred it before. They have no visibility. I wish I'd sent out more project updates. Now, that might be something that a lot of people have heard uh, before from their, their business stakeholders. And it can be a little frustrating. You just put all this time into building out an agile process, but then your business users are saying that actually they have no visibility. But I want to maybe break that down a little bit and explore perhaps why that is. So let's say that our process looks a little bit like this. And the user sets some initial requirements. We go off and we do our first sprint, our second sprint, our third sprint. We do all our burn down charts. We measure our sprint velocity. And then we go into a UAT phase before we release it uh, into the public. Now, if I restate that graph as the loop, it looks a little bit like this. So in the top right, we have those initial requirements, but then we have team responding to feedback and releasing a new product, responding to feedback, releasing a new product, and it's not actually until all the way when you've been around the whole loop does the user actually interact with the product. And so that's not actually a very tight loop. It's actually quite loose. And I would argue that unless you're doing real demos to real users at the end of each sprint and ideally actually releasing into production all you've really done is split a waterfall dev phase into two week blocks. That, that doesn't change anything, really. And that's why people sometimes feel they don't have feedback because the loop is too large. And so they don't know, sorry, well, they don't have visibility is because the loop is too large and they don't know what's going to happen until the end of that loop. I met, sorry for the interruption, but uh, we lose you every so often. Could you bring okay. the microphone closer to your uh, mouth there? Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, That's right. 
Hopefully, hopefully it wasn't. Hopefully it wasn't so bad that you couldn't uh, you couldn't make it out at all. No, it's it's audible, but yeah, just kind of in and out a bit. But okay, I'll leave you alone now. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Um, so yeah, so it, it, what you really ended up doing is breaking up the waterfall uh, dev phase into two week blocks, and that's what prevents some of the visibility. So to to me, my my sort of internal KPI definition for agile is not how long is your sprint process or each individual sprint. It's how long is it from a user giving a requirement or some feedback to them being able to give feedback on the next version. And maybe that's, for some teams, one sprint, in which case, perfect, that's your, that's your loop. But if it's three or four sprints or even longer, which I've seen in some cases, then that is the actual length of your sprint. Uh, here's another example. Well, I built my project using Agile techniques, but no one else in the project did, and now we're having a bunch of issues integrating. Or maybe everyone in the project thinks that they used Agile, um, but they're, they're, they're all having the same issue. Well, here's, here's my uh, example of that. I call it Agile in isolation, where each component, in this case one of the four chairs, has been designed and built really beautifully. But each component was done independently, possibly with their own product owner and their own sprint board, etc. But at no point was there someone who gave the overall feedback around whether this was the correct direction or not, if assuming you wanted four matching chairs. And that's why you get these components that are beautifully built out in your larger projects. But when it comes to it, you don't have a single view. And, and, and in my experience, this is particularly dangerous when it's not real users giving feedback and it's some kind of business analyst or, or, or technical product owner who isn't actually someone who will use the product at the end. So my recommendation for this is always, even if it's the most ugly sketch in the world, and by sketch I mean a very, very simple end-to-end -end integration, that having that end-to-end -end prototype or MVP or whatever you want to call it that gets user feedback at the whole product level is much more important than building out perfect components and then trying to join them together later on in the project. And, and, and I'm going to sort of call back there into the, uh, the Agile manifesto that working software is the primary measure of progress, in this case, the, the set of table and chairs. It doesn't matter how simple it is as long as it's working. I think there's a quote, actually, I should put in the slides, but that any complex software evolved from a piece of simple software that works. And I think that that's a really important thing to think about, especially when doing complex migrations of systems. Um, moving on to uh, APIs. You know, I, I had to include this, it's API days after all. So why is it APIs are actually good? Well, it allows you to decouple components of the feedback loop and also allows you to specialize in elements of the feedback loop or, or perhaps outsource that specialization. So in this particular case, as long as you have that stable contract for the interface between your um, components, you can have really, really tight feedback loops on each component and then integrate through via API. If you have a single monolithic application or something that has a very coupled relationship between components, then you can only have the feedback loop at the whole monolithic level, and that's what slows everything. So by breaking things up into components and then integrating via API, we can parallelize the user feedback loop. So this is something which I think is really interesting is, um, well, what is, the, what is the tightest loop possible? How do we do it the absolute fastest? Well, the absolute fastest would be if the business was making their own changes and there was no loop at all. It's almost like the divide by zero error where it, the, 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 it becomes so tight it goes to infinity. And, and to me, I see a future where low and no code environments become more and more popular amongst business users, where the tech teams provide API backends, um, whether that's into some complicated system or some very simple sort of serverless based Lambda or whatever. Um, and then the business users just stitch those APIs together with their own uh, business UI. And they know exactly what they want. So they're going to build it faster than any loop could possibly uh, indicate. So I think this is kind of the, the, the solution to the feedback loop. Um, secondly, particularly for internal users, um, if you hear something like, I spend too much time testing, how am I supposed to do any work? 
um, there's a cultural break here. And firstly, uh, maybe I should switch these two round. The business really needs to own their own delivery. Um, and, and that's not really a technical question. That's an, an organizational question. But the, the delivery has to belong to the business. Otherwise, you're always going to have uh, problems and questions like this. But secondly, you know, these guys are busy. Give them a break. And don't do manual automated testing. And what I mean by this is where people push out a product that hasn't been automatically tested and then expect business users to do that testing for them. And UAT should never be about seeing if something works. It should be about if it's something is fit for purpose. And that's a very important distinction. Uh, and if you get it right, you get, you get dancing people. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, talking about the B2C user feedback loop, well, this is, comes back to that original point I made, which was uh, around uh, automated versus active feedback. And in B2C, it's very hard to get active feedback because one, you might have a lot of users, and two, the users might not necessarily know why they like or dislike a product. They'll just use words like it feels good or it's slick, but they don't really know why. And this is where I think we have to really, really embrace A-B testing and, and very, very good collection of data to then allow us to make decisions. Because a series of one or 2% improvements through A-B testing or looking at data to see patterns and, and ways that things could be uh, improved could result in vastly different outcomes, right? Um, and and, and I, I think that sometimes um, this is added on almost as an afterthought and as technologists, and I fall foul for this myself, uh, we're so tied up in the function and making sure that things functionally work, but we forget that this is the only way to get the user feedback loop, and so we might be building the wrong function because we haven't closed the loop. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for your time. I apologize for the microphone issues. I'll uh, try better next time, and uh, I'll, I'll open up some questions. Cool. Thank you so much, Ned. Um, I do have a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, so this is actually a really fascinating thing for me because I've been trying to figure out how to, I don't think I had the language right, that you used, but I've been trying to figure out how to close or certainly um, reduce the loop, right? And, and of course, as you said, um, when you, I think the, the, the words you'd use on, on, I think your first or second slide was the user gives feedback. Right. Um, I'm actually quite curious to figure out, have you um, used tools, approaches, patterns, et cetera, for when a user doesn't give you feedback, uh, but that you still want to care about what's happening, right? Such as um, a user tries to log in or they try to do something and they smash the button 20 <laughs> times in yeah. you know, one second. And you know that's a, that's a bad situation, but you're not hearing from that user perhaps yeah. how do you deal with situations like that so it's a great question and i'd say there's two there's two things one is around collection of data and you should collect as much data as you can even if you uh can't if you don't have the capability of the people or whatever to process it at the time capture everything whack it into an s3 bucket it's almost free these days of the, of the volumes you know one cent a gigabyte or whatever it is um so just capture as much as you you can always analyze it after the fact, but you can't recapture it after the fact. Hmm. So if you want to capture that the person's mashed the button 20 times, then do it. So that's just a sort of a general statement I'd say for everything. But I have a much more important thing to say, and that is it comes from a book called Don't Make Me Think uh, by Steve Krugman. And he's, his fundamental premise is that you don't actually have to need to watch that many people use your product to get a huge amount of feedback. But you, the important thing is to watch them and not guide them. So his, his suggestion and that I, I love doing is getting people to use software that's been written by me or my team and not telling them how it works, just giving it to them. And you will very, very quickly find a place mm -hmm. where they're mashing the buttons or they get frustrated with something. Uh, they give up, they, you can see on the face, that, like ideally you should try and record it if you can get a webcam or, or literally have them in a room and just watch people use your software and you will learn more in 10 minutes mm -hmm. than you would in, in a month of anything else. I, I remember I built some software very, very long, it's 15 years ago now, and I was based out of London, but my users were in Dublin and I'd been building for them for a year 
And I flew over to Dublin one day to meet them and watch people use my software. And I was horrified, <laughs> kind of horrified at how it was being used. And I realized I totally missed the point on so many things. But it wasn't until I was sitting there mm. and use it that I realized it's not their fault. You know, it's, it's my fault. But I either hadn't made it clear or I didn't truly understand what they wanted. Mm. No, that's a, that. That is a great book, by the way. I have read it. Uh, okay, I, yeah. I I usually pair that up with the design of everyday things uh, and and the word I of. Uh, I'll that's check a it great out. Book. Um, so there, there's a specific word in there called affordance, right? And it's it's a question of what does the system afford you to do? Mm. And mm. that's kind of what you're talking about as well, right? Is is not telling them what to do but rather watching them right. and then letting the system guide them as well, which exactly. tells you either it's done well or not done well. Exactly. That. Cool. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry. So, um, a similar question along those lines. Um, uh, if you so you mentioned obviously you don't need that many people to figure out what's happening, but mm. if you don't even have that many people, um, uh, or worse, if you collect data but two people are complaining out of a thousand, what do you do with that? Um. Uh, that's that's a good question. I, I need to think about. If, like for 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 the for the first part, I think that the watching just one or two people um, and seeing how they interact with the system is is, is important. I'm talking to them, but that's kind of what I said for the other one. If you've got two people out of a thousand, I think that another sort of important point, and, and, and maybe this answers the question, is that. Um, Sometimes as technologists, I feel that we can get very pulled into a detail that isn't necessarily representative of the business outcome. And if you have a, a good KPI that is um, business focused around whether that's an acquisition, whether it's conversion, profitability, whether it's revenue, whatever it is, um, and that you are optimizing around that KPI, um, and then you are using the customer feedback loop to optimize towards that sort of fitness function, if you will, um, then it might be that a small number of people who uh, are not on board are perhaps the wrong people for your particular system or your particular flow. If it's a straight out bug, that's different and you, you, know, you should investigate. But if it's two out of a thousand who have a differing view, then I think it's worth looking to see, are they optimized around the business KPI that you're looking for? Because we can't optimize around everything. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a fair statement. Um, and maybe there's uh, time for one or two more questions. Um, how do you measure a reduction of the loop? Is it just a time thing? Is it some, some other metric that you're using? Yeah, so, so I think it's important. I think it's important to record the time. Um, but in and of itself, I don't think that that means anything. It goes back to that business KPI. And this is a whole different sort of you know, a deck I have, which is around what are you optimizing around? Why do you want a tight feedback loop? Because in and of itself, it's not necessarily good. And I see this a lot when you talk about people who are doing iteration and experimentation, uh, you know, innovation labs, things like that, who are not part of the core business. And I ask why? Why are you iterating and experimenting? And what is the feedback loop in aid of? Because if it's not around a business-focused KPI, then what's the point? And so what I would really like to see is, as the feedback loop is tightened, what we ought to see is an increase in the business KPI. And if we don't, then we should be asking questions, are we optimizing around the right things? Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you so very much for your presentation. Uh, I know I got quite a bit out of it, so I hope uh, the other listeners did as well.